and unfortunately they have the bad air quality there today, I heard on the news. Uh, but we hopefully it's not affecting his ability to transmit his talk and we look forward to it. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Stolman now. Thank you so very much, Dr. Young. I appreciate that. Yes, I am indeed uh, in Northern California. Uh, uh, although my background is from Amsterdam that you're seeing, a, a research library in, in Amsterdam that I was actually recently at. Um, yeah, we're surrounded by wildfires right now because the pandemic wasn't enough stressor on our lives. So we've got this too. Um, thank you, uh, Howard, and, and thank you, Sabine, for, for putting this all together. You're being humble when you say that, that uh, I and Colleen and others, uh, this, is, this is Hurricane Sabine largely uh, putting this all together. And the rest of us are largely um, along for the ride, which is uh, an impressive thing, and thank you for that. My task today is a little bit strange. I'm, it's not strange, but it's broad, let's put it that way. I'm, I'm, uh, I've been asked to speak about Biome 101, uh, which really means um, uh, sort of the introduction. And, and because of that, I'm going to be covering a, a broad nature of, of topics. So I'm going to be talking about some stuff that may be super rudimentary and boring to some of you, and I'm going to be talking about stuff that might be more sophisticated or more uh, un uninteresting, more, more wonky than you're interested in at all, and that's okay. I'm going to try to just get us all on the same page for the rest of this as we, as we go forward. So this is kind of the setup of, of Biome 101, and really I think the way I, I think about this is, 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 again, as we're going to talk about the beginning of of managing a biome, can we can we manage a biome? So let's uh, let's go on. I don't see my there. We go. Thank you, Dean. I've got them. All right. So I'm going to start with uh, what is a biome. Uh, I had some terms, some real simple definite, not simple. They're complicated, but some definition of terms. Uh, what is a good biome? What is a bad biome? And then we're going to hone in on this one bug, C. diff, which has really taken a prominent place in this world, largely because it was the the sort of first agent that we identified as, as a consequence of a dysbiosis or a bad biome. And so I've conceded it sort of this opportunist that came along and said, aha, you have a bad biome and we're, gonna, we're going to take over. And it really is sort of an opportunist. And then we're going to talk about a little bit about FMT, which is others are going to talk about a lot more than I am, but I'm going to start it off. And of course, FMT is really the, the initial uh, fix, the, the alteration of a biome with the intent to cure a disease, in this case, the disease particularly being, being C. diff. And then I'll conjecture a little bit about where we go from here. So that's kind of the, the direction I intend to take us uh, today. Um, we care about the biome, of course, uh, because we believe, hopefully, that we can promote health by altering or intervening in a biome. And that's sort of the core question. And that's certainly the, the underpinnings of anyone who purchases a probiotic. We believe that we're going to take a biome-altering agent, and that will make us healthy. And certainly that has become insane, as, as everybody knows. Sabine quoted a number, that's a radical number. Uh, John Eisen, who's a PhD up at UC Davis, up in my neck of the woods, he's, he's smokier than I am today. Uh, he, uh, as far as I know, he coined this term microbiomania and has a blog called Overselling the Microbiome, which is really fun to read if you want to see about some of the insanity that's, that's out there with the biome. And uh, this is just a 30-second smattering of stuff I found on the on the internet. Robin, I actually know, she's a wonderful woman in DC. Uh, I trained with her long ago, the microbiome solution. Uh, Viome, of course, uh, suggests that they can, they, can, they can target your biome interventions. Uh, this book is about your baby's biome. It's not your biome anymore. It's now, it's now your baby's uh, biome. So there is this real mania uh, about, about the biome. And I think the mania is also uh, based on not so much can we cure disease, and I mean, can we promote our health, but really where I'm going to go with today is can we diagnose an illness based on biome pathology? Uh, and more importantly, the most important uh, subtext of all of this is can we treat illness uh, based on a biome uh, manipulation? And that's really where we're going to go. So this is the new, new thing. We all know that, certainly. Um, this has been, been, that was not supposed to go forward. Um, I don't know why that auto advanced, but let's go back one. Nope. Uh, we are auto advancing whoever's uh, got tech. Uh, and if we can go back a few slides, I am not advancing that. That is happening on its own. Um, so uh, what I was mentioning is that is that basically this is in the last decade, in essence, and the, the bigger blue line is is domestic people. But you can see the others the others are catching up, and there's a lot of biome research being done around the world um, in a lot of different countries, Australia, China, and the like. And and it's really the one of the dominant research 
uh, fields today. So let's talk about our bugs. Obviously, we're not alone, and that's the core sort of subtext of all of this, that, that we, are, we are a consortium of organisms uh, in us and on us and around us, and there are trillions of them. If you, if you like numbers, we can throw a lot of numbers at you. There are certainly bacteria, viruses, fungi, and, and that term has collectively been referred to as the, the microbiome or, or the biome. But in fact, that's a really an umbrella term, of course. And even within a human being, there are multiple different organ biomes and sort of eight, nine of them are listed here, but there's much more than that. Um, I've listed sort of the, the GI tract biome here, which is dominantly made up of these two phyla, uh, Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes. Um, but we have, we have even within the GI tract, there are oral biome and esophageal biome, uh, colonic biome, obviously. You have a nostril biome. You have a, a hair biome. We are, we are colonized. We are, we are living in a soup of, of bugs. And if you like numbers, there's more of them than there are us, certainly. So in the very simplistic sense, if you're just counting cells, they win. Majority rules, there are more of their cells than there are cells, probably one or twofold X. Uh, and more importantly, uh, or equally importantly, there's, they're genetically much more uh, dense or dominant than we are. There are a lot more uh, bacterial genes, probably 100 X more than there are human genes within, within us. Uh, this is a quote from one of my favorite Neils um, uh, within, and I'm a Neil, of course, within, within one linear centi centimeter of your lower colon, there live and work more bacteria than all the humans who have ever been born, uh, yet we continue to assert that we are, in fact, in charge of the world. You could certainly conceive of us as simply a vehicle to carry all these bugs around with us, where they're their mobile home, if you will, and I'm, I'm a Neil deGrasse Tyson groupie, and I have spent money to go hear him speak because he's just a thoughtful guy. Um, I just saw this recently. Human Microbiome Project says human body has 100 trillion microscopic life forms living in it. You call that living, uh, perhaps. So we're going to hone in, though, more on the colonic biome. That's going to be the subtext of much of a GI biome symposium. But again, in other worlds, there's going to be a lot of other, um, uh, lot of other biome people talking about other, other certainly biomes. But we're going to talk about this. And again, how you even graph a biome. How I even show you a biomes is a questionable issue. How, how do we graphically represent these, these bugs, these extraordinary number of bugs? And here's just one way to do that. You can see, again, these green formicutes and these maroon or red bacteroidetes over here are dominant in, uh, at least numerically, uh, dominant. And again, just to get us all on the same page, this is stuff I wasn't even uh, entirely aware of, but I'm learning. So, so working up from species, we've been talking about phyla. I've been talking about phyla. Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes are, are two of the dominant phyla within our bacterial uh, ecosystem. If you, if you use a human metaphor on the right over here, our species, of course, is uh, Homo sapiens, uh, and we are in the phylum chordata. We're in the animal kingdom. The bugs we're talking about, so E. coli, for example, is the species, but we're now talking about, about the phyla uh, over, over here. And, and it's really fallacious to even think that uh, this that, that listing bugs and giving you names of bugs is, is meaningful. In fact, these bugs live in communities and they interact with us and with themselves. This is not just a, a cohort of, of us and bugs. Uh, we have interactivity with our cohorts of bugs and they have interactivity with themselves, certainly. And, and there are different terms that we're learning for these, but, but this is really a codependency and, and uh, these bugs work in communities and, and ecological niches, if you will. Uh, they help us, bacteria help us digest nutrients. They actually protect us, as we know from C. diff, when we lose bugs, we are at risk of, of, a, of another bug hurting us. They're intimately involved in our immune system development. We help them, of course. We provide uh, nutrients and, and a home uh, for them. So this is a very symbiotic relationship between us and our bugs. And I want to just emphasize that it's also a symbiotic relationship within the bugs. To, to simply believe you're going to take one pill of one particular bacteria and that's going to provide some beautiful homeostasis for your microbial ecosystem is, I think, absurd or absurdly simplistic. And it is absolutely not, not true. And it's not just in us. I, I love this. It's, we've talked about in us, but in fact, it's also uh, on us. This is, I, I, I remember Pigpen from, some of you may be old enough to remember this character. This is Charles Schultz's Pigpen. Um, and, and Charles Schultz drew this guy 50 years ago, basically, uh, with this little dust cloud around him. And I think Charles was, was uh, prescient because, in fact, that dust cloud exists, except it's, part of, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, alive. And there are people who actually study these 
climate chambers, these sanitized chambers, and put people in them for hours, and you can, you can discern their biologic cloud, which apparently is unique to them. There's even data, again, this is auto-advancing, I'm not sure why. Um, according to, to this particular study, your microbial space is distinct, is like a fingerprint, basically, which interestingly brings up some forensic uh, implications. If you can enter a room and say your, your bacteriologic or biome, biome fingerprint is there, you might be able to even si solve a crime one day. Uh, I put this picture on recently when my son was in Tokyo when I was particularly worried about, about personal space and social distancing. This is, of course, the Tokyo subway uh, there. Uh, so when do we get our biome? So we're, we're, we're largely colonized pretty much immediately when, when we're born, or we start the, our colonization when we're born. And, and most of our conception today is that our, our, our biome and, and us become joined in the first few years of our lives and then remain relatively stable. The consensus is that we get sort of a biome in our childhood and that biome is largely intact throughout our lives unless perturbed by antibiotics or chemotherapy or, or other things like that. And of course, birth, not surprisingly, is the place where, where we first get exposed to a biome, uh, particularly a vaginal birth. And, and so vaginal birth to, to an infant, a human infant and skin to skin contact are both important. And as you may know, Infants born by sections who are, are deprived of their vaginal biome exposure seem to have a higher propensity to have allergies, obesity, infections, these, these immune things that seem to be related to sort of lack of biome uh, activation at birth. And then there's some very interesting data that, for example, you can put uh, gauze pads in the laboring mother's vagina. You can then rub them right after birth, immediately after birth, over the infant's mouth and skin. Um, and we can certainly demonstrate that you can colonize that kid. Um, and alter their biome profile, whether that translates in, in age 10 or 20 or 30 to decreased illness has not been shown at all. We can't, we can't suggest that, but we certainly can say that kids born, for example, by C-sections have a different biome than kids who are vaginally born, and that we can recolonize them if we take vaginal gauzes and basically swab it over them. So that's the start of, of uh, where we're born. Mom really does give us our, our first biome exposure, but it's not just mom. It's where mom and you live. The, the built environment, so to speak, is very important, and that's an interesting term. The built environment is the world around us, and the world around us very clearly also uh, impacts our, our biome exposure in our youth particularly. There's lots of data, for example, that, that uh, kids who grow up with pets, you probably know that, or livestock, so growing up on a farm or with a lot of pets seem to have lower risks of subsequent later life uh, diseases like asthma or atopic dermatitis and things like that. Some interesting data that patients with C. diff, RCDIs, recurrent C. diff infection, who own pets do better. They have less recurrence uh, presumably because their pets are giving them biome diversity and that that is protecting them against their C. diff. We know that kids who get more antibiotics in early life have later subsequent problems like obesity, asthma, IBD. There's some fun stuff like, uh, for example, if you look at farmers' biomes, they're different than, I'm a city boy for sure, I live in downtown Oakland. Uh, my biome is different than, you know, my, my Aunt Franny who, who lives on a farm in upstate New York. Um, take sailors who, uh, who are land-based and then they go out to sea. Their biome changes, interestingly, actually. So you have a sea biome and a land biome. Lots of lifestyle things, as I mentioned, can, can correlate with our biome changes. In fact, not only do, do, is our biome influenced by us, but it's very clear that our biome influences us as well, that this is really a two-way a two street. It is not uh, simply one way. Diet's obviously important. Of course, that's what we put into us, and, and with those foods and bugs comes biome alterations. And it's clear that our modern urban populations, that's me sitting in, in a downtown urban area, uh, I likely have a, a less diverse biome than someone living in a much more rural area, and particularly indigenous populations who most typically eat a lot more fiber and have more diverse biomes. And, and our biome can radically affect simply, for example, how we uh, metabolize glucose. There's interesting data on, on that. It can influence leptin, which certainly can influence our appetite or our diet. And then there's some, some cool data. I do some research in how our diverticulosis changes with immigration patterns over life. This is some data sort of in a parallel way looking at what happens to immigrants' biomes over time. And it turns out uh, diverticular impacts to generations, uh, not, not biome impacts. Those, those can take literally nine months and you start hanging out in our country and your biome westernizes. And I will stress that that's not a good thing uh, at all. What, what happens with that, quote, westernization of, of their biome is less diversity, um, you lose uh, uh, 
uh, Prevotella, for example, you gain bacteroidetes, uh, you lose some fiber degrading enzymes. It is not particularly healthy necessarily to, to, be, to have a, an Americanized, so to speak, or a Westernized uh, biome. That's not necessarily uh, good for you. Um, one word on food, one more word on food before I leave food. Um, red wine's a food, as it turns out. Well, grapes are a food, certainly, and I, I just saw this recently. Uh, this is just from this year, and I love it, so I'm going to show it to you. Um, three different population-based cohorts looking at red wine, looking at alcohol consumption in, in general. Turns out red wine consumption increases your alpha diversity, and I'll, I will show you that you want more alpha, you probably want more alpha diversity. So, so your glass of red wine every night is medicine in, in a sense. White wine works not as well as red wine. Uh, tequila does not work, unfortunately. So, so the answer is here is, uh, is your red wine. Uh, it, will help, it will help increase your alpha diversity. You're not, you're not having a nightcap, you're increasing your alpha diversity. Uh, here's another study I found, and I, I think the reference is not shown, but I can find it for anybody. This was a, a, an interesting study looking at relationships and, and gut uh, biomes. And you know, again, I told you this thesis that, that our biome is established in our youth and then largely remains um, alike, which would suggest that, that siblings, for example, should have quite similar biomes, um, assuming they were raised together. Um, we also know that marriage is healthy. Married people are healthier in a whole bunch of different ways than unmarried people, says the divorce man, uh, unfortunately. But marriage is healthy for you. And, and one of the questions we've asked is, well, is that because you're sharing a biome? Is it possible that, that you're sharing a biome? So uh, these smart people in Wisconsin who have literally 10,000 uh, graduates from high school, uh, that they, a cohort that they started in the 50s, so more than 50 years ago. And on the graphs on your right, basically, lower is, is closer and better in a sense in this case. So turns out living with your spouse, um, you, you have more similar biomes to your spouse than to your siblings. And that's a little bit surprising because we really, we, we, we thought that your biome is probably established in your youth and it stays the same. But I, I love that concept, right? You live with someone, of course you share biomes. That's not, that's not uh, surprising. You're living in a home with someone else, you're sharing foods and toothbrushes and things like that. And your biome gets more diverse and more rich if you're living with a spouse than living alone. And that's maybe part of the reason. But then the part I really loved was they actually asked all the participants to grade the closeness of their marriage. So this is not a, a, a very objective endpoint. It's a very subjective endpoint. But nonetheless, people are asked to say we have a very close marriage, a somewhat close marriage, or a not very close marriage. And the wonderful outcome to me was that the closer you said your marriage were, was the more similar your biomes were. And I just think that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So there you go. Uh, in the irrelevant facts department. And this slide, again, I don't know why we're auto um, advancing. This slide is here as a joke. You don't have to use this slide. I found this in a, in a paper I was just looking at recently. And it's looking at gluconeogenesis and metabolic roles of the biome. And I'm not talking about that today, but I just thought this was the either best or worst graphic I've ever seen in my life. And and you can take it for what you will. I do not expect you to pay attention to that. Um, so, so what is a good biome? Um, you know, here's all these bugs, this universe of bugs that we're living with. Um, what, what makes a good biome? And I don't know. Here's, here's the answer to the lecture. I don't know. Uh, we don't know. What we do know is we can list them for you, right? So we can give you a field guide, if you will. If you're a, a butterfly collector or a birder or, or a or a scuba diver, and we collect, you know, we catalog, or even an African safari person, you catalog the, the organisms you see, right? When I, when I scuba dive, I talk about the different things I saw. And um, we can do that with our bugs. We can draw a catalog for you, and you can say, you have this 2,000 different named organisms in your colon. But what does that really mean, and how are they interacting with each other, and what does that mean to you is relatively unanswered. I keep mentioning diversity. It's one of the things we think is probably true that, that a diverse biome is better, a more diverse biome is better than a less diverse biome. And a lot of things like antibiotics and chemotherapy constrict the diversity of our biome. We know that a lot of biome interventions enhance the diversity of our biome. And that's probably one of the most simplistic truisms today. But I'm quite sure we'll talk next year and, and we'll, uh, we'll decide that's not true anymore. Um, this is just something I, I found. I'm a very unusual human, and, and I saw this one. I see the problem. Your gut microbiome is out of balance. One moment. Wait, I think you mean my microbiome, right? Uh, nope. <laughs> Swallow this. <laughs> I'll leave that to, to you. 
Um, all right, this is a slide. We're going to come back to diversity, but I, I'm just making the case to you that diversity is one thing we know. And just in a very simple way, this is a study uh, looking. At, we have ways to measure diversity. One of those ways is this thing called the Shannon Diversity Index. Uh, this is a patient before an FMT with a low diversity score. This is the donor stool that is being used, and you can see it's more diverse. And sure enough, if you follow the recipient at one week, uh, two weeks, and four weeks after their FMT, their diversity has increased and stays increased. So diversity does seem to be a core feature here. I think I should show that again. This is a little Homer boosterism. I'm an Oakland boy. I've probably said that word three or four times already. I'll say it again. Um, this is a classic study of the herfindahl hirschman Index, which I, I'm sure you all know about and I don't need to explain to you, but the herfindahl hirschman Index is a language diversity metric. I'm being facetious, of course. It looks at, at diversity of languages as a marker of diversity of a community. And if you look at cities of greater than 400,000 in this world, uh, in this country rather, you can see that the number one city for language, at least based diversity, uh, is Oakland, California. So a little bit, a little bit of, a little bit of hometown love uh, for us. Um, okay, and th this is actually my biome. Again, we're, how do you even express our biome? This is my biome. You biome before they went out of business while they were shut down for fraud, but more than, quote, just going out of business, they were fraudulently billing. But Ubiome was a place, and there are others, where for 99 bucks or 129 bucks, you can send someone a swab of your stool, or Progenobiome for that matter, and someone could give you a nice little graph and say, hey, this is what your stool looks like. And I sent mine in and got this back, and I, I got stars, so I'm really proud of my biome. I got Permacutes and, and Bacteroides disease. I, I liked a little more of these and a little less of these, but that's, that's what I got. I love my unique biome organisms, and I don't know why that's happening, but I love my, uh, my lentisphere. I've got, I've got unique microorganisms. Uh, it's actually a little weird because these are the least common, yet they're the most unique, and I'm not quite sure what you biome meant about that, but, but so be it. You too can get a catalog of your biome, and what you do with that is you make a slide of it and you tell other people about it because that is the only health impactful consequence of this information today, unfortunately. Uh, hopefully it will be. So, so how can things go bad? So that's kind of a little, little primer on good stuff. How do they go bad? And I've hinted at a bunch of those ways already. First of all, a bad bug can outgrow. So we call that a pathobiont. So a commensal bug that might be present in a small amount, but can kind of bloom, almost like an algae bloom in, in the ocean. So you have this little bug, like, for example, C. diff, that might be there, might be a colonizer, might be present in a small amount, and then can bloom with a change in your biome and make you sick. Um, you can also, of course, lose commensals, healthful organisms that live in you, your normal microbiota, again, due to either killing by antibiotics or chemotherapy or decreased proliferation. And that's part of at least why FMT works. We're putting commensals back in people. We're also increasing diversity. That's what FMT does as well. Uh, so those are both helped by that. The hard question is, again, are these all these catalogs sort of cause or consequence? And that's a unifying theme in all of this is uh, things are different but is that necessarily causal or ideologic? And it's very hard to draw that line for a lot of these things. In fact, some have suggested that our semantics are wrong. We shouldn't talk necessarily about a dysbiosis. That word, the root is bad, dys, um, dysphagia, right? Um, but rather a very biosis, meaning your biome's changed, but without ascribing sort of a subjective uh, favorable or unfavorable mechanism to that or mechanistic role to it. It is an alteration in a biome, but... Um, but not necessarily good or bad. Um, I'm not going to be the science wonk, but I'll throw some stuff out there um, for a couple of slides, and there are a lot of science wonks following me. Remember, we're not generally culturing bugs. That's hard to do. Instead, we're looking at their, their genetic uh, material, either their DNA or their transcription, and that leads to a lot of potential errors. How you collect it, how you store it, how you extract it, you get a lot of noise. You can get a lot of noise from that. Um, and, and again, you're only looking at a particular snapshot. You may not be looking at the other components of our microbial soup. You may be just looking at bacteria, but remember there are viruses, protozoa, fung fungi. Um, even stool may not be the right answer. These are things that are shed in your feces that may be significantly different than the bugs that are living inside you and working and adhering to your mucosa. It's not a given that the bugs you poop out are the same bugs that are working hard for you in the lining of your colon. And again, the simple presence of a bug doesn't mean that that bug is either good nor bad. In C. diff, in many cases of C. diff, it is simply 
colonization. And, and the volume, I like this quote from, from Rob Knight. Um, uh, this is not mine, but the volume of data is absolutely just insane. One teaspoon of stool contains in its bacterial DNA alone the amount of data it was like 100,000 thumb drives to store and would weigh basically a ton. So this is, how do we even express that data? How do we analyze that data? As you probably know, there's an entire field now of the numbers of the biome, the stats of the biome, bio, you know, biome statistics. Again, I'm not gonna entirely get into science. That's not what I do, I'm a clinician. Um, but, but you're gonna see these terms throughout our symposium. There's 16 S ribosomal analyses. These, that is a 16 S ribosomal is a gene that's found in all bacteria, but, but, and that was kind of our workhorse for a long time, but it, may, it has a lot of flaws. And now we're moving sort of more towards shotgun metagenomics, which is largely replacing this, also includes, includes virus and fung, fungi. You get a better strain resolution. The problem is if you're, if you're for example, taking uh, tissue biopsies like I do colonoscopically, you also get human DNA. And anytime you get human DNA, you have a whole issue with privacy concerns for sure. People look at metatranscriptomics, which looks at RNA transcription, which is more helpful perhaps because it's now it's looking at gene expression, not just gene presence. And then ultimately we wanna look at metabolomics, which is basically function, what is happening. So you have the gene that is coded there, you have the product of transcriptions of genes, and then of course you have the function and the metabolome. And, and those are all different things and, and measured uh, in somewhat different ways, certainly. So we can look at a lot of different things. We can give you a population study and say, here's what the genes are. That's kind of easy, that's easier to do, but what does that really tell us? And then we can do some math and say, well, people with gene, with this gene profile, with this microbiome profile rather have this illness or are skinny. And this people with this microbiome profile are obese, obese rather, but does that necessarily mean that one is causing the other? Um, then you can start looking at, at function, and that's, for example, what FMT really is. Or can, we, can we treat a disease? Can we put in, can we transplant a microbiome from one a human to another, or in the case of, of this, a mouse, so we know we can take uh, fecal material, if you will, biomaterial from a lean mouse, uh, put it into an obese mouse and make them leaner or vice versa. And of course, that's exactly what we're trying to do with, with FMT for, for skin, um, is take a healthy biome and, and cure a disease. And, and really, C. diff is our proof of concept. C. diff is, has taken on a giant, you know, outsized uh, importance in this world because it is the the kind of proof of concept of this. You have an illness caused by a dysbiosis that we can reliably cure by installing healthy stool. And that's extraordinary. I think that that as a step in, in human science is absolutely extraordinary. And I think unequivocally true at this point. I mean, the data is, is really substantial and is just really the little doorway in a little Alice in Wonderland way to a, a much giant, a much, much, much bigger universe outside of that door. But I'm just gonna talk about, about that door uh, for, for a minute. Uh, so we're gonna talk about CDF. You can't talk about the biome without this really important bug. This is a graphic from our CDC. Your tax dollars paid for this, this graphic art. Uh, we're at threat level urgent, by the way, if you didn't know that. Um, this is like DEF CON for, for microbe nerds. Uh, we do. We have a threat level scale, and the scale goes up to five, and we are currently apparently at threat level urgent, which means a lot of people are dying, and we're spending a lot of money on this bug. By the way, I had to alter the sign. It initially said clustr clostridium, which has been renamed as clostridioides, uh, so I, that's, that's homemade. I've, I've altered that government property there. There's probably a crime in there somewhere. Um, this, this bug is a gram-positive spore-forming bug. Those spores matter really for the clinical problems with this bug. That's the problem. Uh, C. diff is found in healthy infants. It's a normal commensal in newborns, and it's frankly a normal commensal in many of us. There's 150 people on this call or some such uh, number, and probably 10, 15 of us, particularly in healthcare, are colonized with C. diff, and that's okay. We work with this. We're in healthcare facilities. Many of us are colonized with C. diff, but we're probably not sick, most of us, and put someone in a hospital for two days and a third of them will get colonized, put someone in a SNF or a long-term care facility and half of them will get colonized for sure. Leading cause of nosocomial uh, diarrhea and absolutely has a mortality rate in our sick and elderly and comorbid mor morbid patients, much like our, our other pandemic right now, this is a disease that preys on susceptible people. And as you probably know, there's also an epidemic strain of this bug, the NAP1 or the BI027 strain, which basically has a mutation in a toxin suppressor gene. So it makes more toxin. And because it makes more toxin, it's harder to cure and harder to keep cured. 
Um, to get C. diff, you have to have both get exposed to the bug, usually by hanging out in healthcare. That's the most common way to get exposed to the bug. And then your biome has to get messed up, and that's usually due to antibiotics. Again, not always. It is a person-to-person -person transmission. You got this from someone else. The problem is that the in between someone else and you, these spores are hardy little mothers, and they can live outside of people for days, weeks, and probably even months. And they are hard to cure. They are resistant to common disinfectants. Um, Alcohol-based hand sanitizers do not kill them. They live on, on handrails and, and flush toilets and doorknobs and things like that. These spores are super hardy. Then the next person ingests them. They germinate in you. They multiply in your colon. And now you have, have illness. And that is really the, the problem with this, with this bug is this spore. I mentioned a lot of people get colonized, and that's okay. You're not sick from that. However, if you're colonized, you are absolutely more at risk of getting ill or sick from C. diff later on if you get a disrupted biome. Uh, some people get mild diarrhea. Some people in the hospital get very severe fulminant diarrhea, and that's a whole different conversation is how to deal with fulminant C. diff. What us cl clinicians deal with more typically certainly outpatient clinicians, are these people who have multiply recurrent infections. You treat them, about 20% of people will recur after one infection. And then that population, about 40% of them will recur after a second, um, after a first recurrence, about over a third will do it again. And by the time you've recurred a second time, almost two thirds of them will continue to recur. And that's really this common problem we have is we can't really cure these people. The antibiotics we give, typically Vanco or Fidax or Flagyl, um, they, they can kill the bug, but they don't kill these spores very well, and these recurrences are very, very common. There are a couple of guidelines out on how to treat C. diff. I'm not going to recapitulate them. The ACG guidelines are old. They're being rewritten by a few of us on this call today, um, myself included, and they will be out shortly. I hope within six months or so, maybe less than a year, you will have new ACG guidelines. The ID Society guidelines came out in 2013, and then they just came out again in 2018. And these two documents are largely concordant. Um, in all of them, with the perspective C. diff, which is really what we're talking about today, the early ACJ guidelines basically said, consider C. diff after a third recurrence and a failed pulsed Vanco regimen. The ID guidelines came out and said a very similar thing, recommended for patients with multiple recurrence who fail appropriate antibiotic treatments. They don't say what is an appropriate antibiotic treatment, nor should they. Um, and they don't sort of define multiple with a specific number, nor should they. I think that's appropriate. The ACG guidelines that are going to come out this year are, are very likely, this is all still preliminary, but are very likely to say quite simply that after second or further recurrence, FMT is an appropriate uh, therapy for your, for your C. diff. Um, and here's just a graphic of what, it, what an FMT is. It basically means you're taking feces, typically healthy, fe uh, intentionally healthy feces from a healthy human and putting it in another with an intent to make them better. We didn't make this up. This has been around for, for millennia. In fact, certainly centuries, there's descriptions in old Chinese medicine texts about, about infants with dysentery drinking yellow soup, presumptively drinking drinking fecal material. The vets have known this for more than 100 years, this concept of transphonation, taking, taking stool from healthy, a healthy animal, putting it up the tush of an unhealthy animal has been around for literally since at least 2008, I've seen, uh, excuse me, 1908. And uh, I think we may, Alex may talk about Eisenman more, but the first sort of human FMT that we're aware of in modern times, sort of modern published scientific times, was a surgeon in Denver who used fecal enemas from his residence in four patients with pseudomembranous colitis in the hospital. They didn't have C. diff testing then. They didn't know about C. diff, they pre but this was presu presumptive C. diff. These are pseudomembranous colitis patients who got better with fecal enemas from surgical interns, basically. And we are calling it FMT, but I want to just give a nod to the fact that there's a conception that we're, we're, it's, a, it's a misterm, and Alex may talk about that more later, because uh, he wrote an editorial about this with Larry Brandt, talking about uh, potentially renaming this as IMT, or intestinal microbiota transplantation. Uh, how do you do an FMT? I'm not going to get into it, but I'm going to give you a very simple reference. Uh, Jessica Allegretti and many other co-authors published a really nice primer on, on this. They, it was, Catchily titled the five D's, decision, discussion, donor, delivery, 
discharge. Um, it really is kind of a step-by-step -step guide to how to do an FMT, and, and I would refer uh, interested parties to that. Uh, obviously, there are lots of different ways to get poop in someone. You can put it in ab above, so to speak, from a nasogastric tube or a nasopharyngeal tube. You can put it in from, and you can also put it in above with via pills, of course, which is where we're going to. You can put it in from below via an enema or a colonoscopy, and there's various pluses and minuses that we can talk about to, to those different routes of delivery. Um, why does it work? And, and I think this is Alex's data on the left, actually, and I think he's going to show it later, too. But the short answer is this is just very graphic. Um, and I just wanted to show right here on your left, uh, in, the, in the middle is your donor with a whole lot of orange uh, over there. And you can see the, the, uh, the recipient over here looks very different. And then over here, this is your donor two weeks later and your donor four weeks later. And you can see that the donor, excuse me, the recipient, rather, the patient looks a whole lot like the donor over the next uh, two to four weeks. And that, that is durable. We have very good data that that persists, i.e. the new stool and grafts. That's a reasonable term uh, for this. Um, on the right is just another style. Here's your donor, lots of blue and green over here. Here's your sick patient with lots of red. You can see what those things are. It doesn't matter. More importantly, here's your patient on the right. After their transplant, they look like the donor. That is your patient. They got a little bit of red left over here, but largely they are looking much more like the donor, i.e. The new, pool, the new stool has engrafted. And I already showed you this slide earlier. Diversity goes up and, and stays up. And there's extraordinary data now to FMT. Uh, you know, I, I did one of these very early trials 10 years ago, but there's now wonderful data. And here's just a bunch of systematic reviews. And I just kind of put them together. Uh, once again, it's not, uh, it's auto advancing. Um, uh, over, overall, 85 to 90 plus percent people are better. There is, I think, a very clear signal that, that lower administration is better than upper administration, so to speak, um, uh, probably by a 10% rate. We, we seem to be better with lower, lower administration. Uh, I have two teenagers who are horribly embarrassed by what I do. Uh, my daughter didn't, didn't understand FMT, the dad kind of puts poop up people's tushes for a while until, and she's a giant fan of this show, Grey's Anatomy, and I'm not kidding you, a few years ago, Grey's Anatomy did a stat FMT, that's McDreamy in the middle, and I'm pretty sure, you know, my daughter's seeing me exactly like that, that's the image she has for me, I think I look a little more like some of the other people from a hairline perspective, but um, anyway, no joke, Grey's Anatomy, there's a call, Page, the, the pager goes off and there's someone in the ER with, with a horrible life-threatening C. diff infection. They race to the ER and they do a stat fecal transplant and the patient goes home four hours later. That's, of course, absurd, but it, it made me cool at home for the first time in, in decades, basically. That's my teenage daughter. I also have a son. He is, they're no longer teenagers, but he thought FMT arrived when this happened. <laughs> This is South Park. I'm not kidding you. This is what I do every day. That's good. Stay still. Almost there. That's not exactly how we do it, to be honest. But that, but that's close. And when we made South Park, boy oh boy, did we did we make a big time. So my kids have not recognized us. All right, um, FMT, we're gonna close up shop very shortly here. I'm getting close to the end. Uh, FMT has been looked at. So C. diff is, is what I've been talking about, but I wanna let you know that there's a lot of people looking at FMT for other things. In fact, I was able to find 200 different studies on PubMed of looking at FMT for A, B, C, D, and E. I'm just highlighting five of them for you here. Probably round two is IBD, just FYI. If you're thinking about what in the gut Biome alteration therapies, again, that may be different in the vagina and the ears and the mouth and other places, but with gut, gut microbiome alteration, C. diff is clearly, you know, index case one, but I think number two is we want to be as likely to be IBD, and there's a lot of data being worked at on, on that. The data is inconsistent. We're largely looking at UC before Crohn's. UC is probably a more homogeneous disease. The dose response in UC is 20 to 30 percent, which, which is nothing like the C. diff response, which is 80 to 90 percent. Without a doubt, I think it's, it's pretty clear that, uh, that you, your ulcerative colitis treatment with, with biome restorative therapy is likely to take more treatments than, than C. diff does. One FMT is really effective for C. diff, may not be true in IBD. The other thing we're seeing in IBD is, is likely what we call a donor effect, meaning it matters whose poop you put in. The cool thing about C. diff, I mean, we got really lucky if you think about it, right? C. diff is, was common enough 
and easy to treat. You could put almost anyone's poop in almost any way, shape, or form, and they get better. Put it with an enema, with a pill, with a nasal tube, with a colonoscopy, and put in donor A, B, C, D, E, F, or G. It doesn't matter. C. diff patients get better, and thank goodness for that. That ain't going to be true for other diagnoses, and it is almost certainly true that for IBD, we're going to be looking for donor Bs or super donors or rational donors, whatever you want to call them. These are donors that are that, are, that we know work better for illness X versus illness Y, and that's assuredly coming, coming your way. IBD is a giant market. and People want this to work for, excuse me, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, excuse me. People so want this to work for IBS. The problem with IBS is that that's a word or a term that is a giant umbrella of illnesses. There are many different irritable bowel syndromes subsumed under that title. When we can truly select, I think, for IBS that is due to a markedly dysbiotic patient, then we can perhaps fix that patient's dysbiosis. The problem is right now we're just taking all comers and that's hard to do. There's data on HE, which is hepatic encephalopathy, multiple drug resistant organisms and autism spectrum disorders, all looking early favorable data, very early, open label. These are not RCTs. The RCTs are only really being seen in C. diff and, and IBD and, and uh, IBS actually as well. So it's exciting and coming, but, but nothing is ready for prime time besides C. diff. I think C. diff is the only thing that, that is, is data supported at this point. This slide I made a little while ago, and it's and and Zane, it's Zane's data, but was Zane's graphic, but it's already outdated because in the last few weeks we've actually seen the last few months certainly we've seen these are kind of the next three things coming, and I'll highlight that Finch on the bottom are making whole stool capsules. Finch is is um, is in is in Boston and was a spinoff of Open Biome, which is the nonprofit uh, public stool bank. Finch has a pill capsule-based product being studied in a study called PRISM-3, which is closed now, and has reported preliminary results that are, that are quite effective, the 70 to 80% range, and, uh, and that's coming. Ceres uh, is another company that, that interestingly had a, an initial trial that was negative. They now have a new trial that they just released in the last couple of weeks as positive. This is narrow spectrum. This is a grouping of, quote, ecospores. I'm not sure what an ecospore really is, but that's the semantic term they've, they've chosen. This is a group of sort of rationally or presumably rationally defined bugs put in a pill. This is given over three days after a bowel prep, so it's a little bit different. And the study they just reported was after a second recurrence, was a later stage population. But in that population, um, it was effective. They reported positive results in that population with, with this three-day protocol and a bowel prep. So, so that's very favorable as well. And none of this is yet approved, but, but I think these are certainly going in that direction and we can talk more about that. You, can't, you shouldn't talk about FMT without talking about safety. So, and, and I'm probably being unfair by giving only one slide to safety. I should probably devote much more time to this, but there's certainly a whole lot of theoretical and absolutely actual risks to FMT. Certainly you're putting fecal material into someone and you can certainly put in other things with that fecal material, CMV, norovirus, that's been described in home FMTs. And you all, I'm sure if you're on this call, you're aware that a few months ago, there were two cases of, a, of an, an extended spectrum beta lactamase producing E. coli and MDRO found after FMT and one of those patients died. So there's one fatal FMT. It was a bug that was in the donor that both of these immunocompromised patients received in a clinical trial. This wasn't a trial. It was, it's been very publicly and appropriately discussed in the New England Journal. Um, this is a bug that is now being screened for everywhere, but you can see that you can get behind the eight ball. This was a bug that wasn't being screened for in that study and, and caused illness. So you, there's always gonna be the potential that there's something we don't know about yet that we're putting into people. And then, of course, we have to put it into people away so people can get a colonoscopy or aspirate. There's risks of the administration as well. And then, and then, of course, so there's, could I give you a bad bug? Yes. Could I hurt you while I'm giving you a bad bug? Yes. And could I hurt you by changing your biome? Of course, I'm trying to change your biome to make you healthier. But is it possible that an altered biome is prone to other pathology? Could we make you obese by changing your biome? Could we make you prone to autoimmune diseases? Could we flare your IBD? And all of those have been discussed. There's a suggestion that those might be real. In one of our series of early, an early open label case series we did, we saw a bunch of people who developed autoimmune diseases later after their FMT. Now, 
this was a population largely of middle-aged and older women who get autoimmune diseases. So it's not entirely surprised that ITP and rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren's and the like will show up. But is it also possible that the FMT turned up some immune signaling that's perhaps helpful in fighting their C. diff, but maybe not helpful in, in a different way? And, and that's a legitimate question that we have to um, pay attention to, for sure. Uh, so I'm going to finish. I'm going to close now with, uh, with auto advancing slides. So we're done here, but unanswered questions. Uh, how do I give someone poop? NG, nasal duodenal tube, flex sig, colonoscopy, pills. Do we give people healthy stool from just anyone? Do we give people rational stool from a selected donor? Do we find the right donor? Are there super donors? And I think there probably are super donors. And then do we give people stool or do we come up with this synthetic stool? There's, there's actually a machine out there called a RoboGut, believe it or not, where someone's trying to kind of create the, a better synthetic stool. And that seems very appealing. That's what series model is based on. Um, I don't know if that's gonna be true or not. Um, and we're gonna find that out certainly. Um, we haven't created fake blood yet, I'll tell you that. We still give people whole blood, and that's not a perfect metaphor, but, but it's something to think about. We have not, in 100 years, come up with a synthetic, a very good synthetic blood product. Are we going to come up with a synthetic stool product? And again, that's a, a flawed meta, meta, metaphor. And then let me just throw out there that stool has a lot of other things in it besides bacteria. So giving someone a, a, a little pill full of eight good bugs um, may not be the answer. There are other things in our stool. There's a virome, a fungome, a metabolome, there are phages, all these things I mentioned before, they may well play a role in what is the benefit of an FMT. I didn't show you, but there's a fascinating, albeit very small and hypothesis generating study that showed if you filter out the stool and kill the bacteria, it still helps C. diff. You can give people a sterile filtrate of a stool product and fix their C. diff and the bugs are out, the bugs are dead. There's not living bacteria. So that raises a whole lot of questions about it. Um, we're still in an FDA uh, gray zone, appropriately and understandably, and the FDA is largely being, being rational about this, but and exercising what are called um, enforcement discretion, meaning, which is an interesting term, a very governmental term. You know, we're not saying you can do this, but we're saying we're not going to, in, we're going to show discretion in our enforcement. We're not going to put you in jail for doing this if you're doing it right. Um, indications beyond C. diff, as I mentioned, are still very much to be determined. C. diff, I think, is a given. I really do. And certainly the first approved products are going to be for C. diff, or I hope and assume they will be, because that's really the, 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 the best data set we have so far. But I think it's much more interesting. I mean, C. diff's important, and not to, I spent a lot of my days taking care of C. diff people, so I'm not minimizing the impact of C. diff on our, on our patient population, our community. But I'm much more excited and interested in the fact that this is just, again, a tiny little door, a tiny little window for a much, much, much bigger conversation about bacterial therapy and targeted biome restoration. And that's really what this symposium, I think, is, is going to get at. And thank you, Sabine, for, for putting it together. And then I will close with, I mentioned I embarrassed my teenagers. I will close with really the most embarrassing thing I've ever done in my professional career, which is land my ass on the cover of a local newspaper with literally the words, the future of feces embedded on my chest in a flippin' Superman font, because that's how I roll, apparently. Um, if you have a 15-year-old, uh, they're going to find this less than, than amusing when their friends uh, see this. And with that, I will say I am done. Uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, we got a lot to do today, and there's going to be Q&A time. I don't know whether it's an hour later. Yeah, we'll, we'll Neil, let's, let's have some. I have a couple of questions for you before the next speaker. Uh, so the first one is, um, you mentioned the fee, the FMTs are stable. How long have you followed people with FMTs? Uh, well, clinically, for a very long time, there's clinical data that suggests um, that if we don't disrupt their biome, they stay well. And again, we can disrupt biomes in a lot of ways with more antibiotics, chemo, things like that. But in, in a number of series of case series that are followed over time, um, people stay cured, if you will, until we mess up their biome again. Um, there's also data that the the engraftment, so to speak, is durable. And I'm, I'm, I can easily think of a three-month data set that at three months, I think it's probably much longer than that, and I can't pull the data reference up for you. But, but engraftment is durable, and it does, it does remain. All right. And I, I, maybe I missed this, but do you clean the patient before you administer it? Uh, it depends what you... So for colonoscopic FMT, yes. For enema FMT, no. For pills from Finch, no. For pills from Ceres, yes. Uh, so we don't know yet, actually. So okay. that's why you didn't hear me, because there's not a single answer. 
Yeah, and what? How many bugs I mean, like are in the pills themselves? So, I, so the question comes up: Is how how can you can you really modify the genome, the biome uh, by administering bugs? There's a Nobel Prize waiting for both of us if we can figure that out. <laughs> this many bugs. That's exactly how many it takes. That many. Okay, very good. And what do you do with patients that have responded poorly? You mentioned that there's been cases. So what do you? What is your approach to? Uh, yeah. So the first thing we them. simply do is a second FMT, actually, and and with a different donor. So the key there different is, donor. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Because again, I mentioned that there may be donor specific effects, and there's good data on that as well. That you can capture probably nine. You capture probably nine out of ten with the first FMT for C diff. You can probably capture another eight out of ten with a second FMT. So. Different donor FMT is absolutely your next step. Okay, and how valuable are animal models? Are they of any value or is it really, no, they really don't mean anything? <laughs> uh, no, I think they mean a lot in terms of hypothesis generating. I think it's incredibly difficult to extrapolate. Again, so for example, take the mouse obesity data, which gets a lot of headlines and a lot of press and a lot of clickbait, but, but it's gonna be really hard to translate that into, into humans thus far. And we had a, another question, is resveratrol a substitute for the red wine? <laughs> don't know, but don't know. <laughs> and um, what do you think about the studies where babies born by C-section are being given the vaginal microbiome of their mothers? Yeah, so I mentioned that earlier. That may have been someone who logged on a little bit late. We yeah. actually touched, touched on that. Um, it's, it's, it's important. It's logical. We can certainly demonstrate that you can put the bugs on the baby and they live, they hang out, the bugs show up. Whether that translates into later in life health has not been shown that I'm aware of.